Okay. Um, I'm just going to give a few. Um, I, th I thought I'd just say a few quick words about test three and then also maybe talk about um, our problem set for this week, begin talking about it. We'll talk more about the problem set on Thursday uh, if anybody wants to come and ask questions about it. Um, so uh, I haven't quite gotten back the test three evaluations, uh, but they should be back pretty soon here. Uh, I did post an uh, example solution. Um, let me go ahead and um, discuss that. So I had one or two things that I wanted to, to, to talk about, about semaphores, um, you know, and, and about basically about uh, deadlocks um, from our last uh, unit here. Um, okay, so for the first question, you know, so you're given these two, uh, I guess you'd call them functions, and you were told that the, um, the functions execute them currently, um, and they share the sum for a variable, and they share um, the integer variable x is, is a shared memory variable, right? So the first question was, if the two process get by equal CPU time, uh, what would you expect the final value of x to be? Um, so, you know, if, if you knew that, that they ran both 100 times, what value would x have? All right. So for that, I mean, most people got this correct uh, in the sense that um, uh, SNR, even though we're using two semaphores, um, um, and but but we do have the the problem that that we switch them. So you know, the foo gets s followed by r, and then releases s followed by r. But uh, bar gets r followed by s. Right. So, so uh, acquires them in, in a different order here. Right. But but uh, even though we've got two semaphores. Um, these will still act as a perfectly valid uh, lock in order to define a critical section. So given the assumption that, um, that these both ran exactly 100 times, you would expect x to be zero, the, the same as what it was initialized at, all right? So that's, that's perfectly fine, except um, um, is it possible for it to be something to, so the, the, if they both ran exactly 100 times, you know, obviously, uh, because the semaphores are protecting, you know, the, the reason why it's a little bit subtle. The, the, the reason why you would expect zero is the, the, the semaphore, two in this case, really are protecting the, the access to X, right? So, you know, even though this is looks like an atomic operation in a high-level language, like you know, this is kind of like C plus plus code or pseudo C plus plus code here, you know, this this would this is not an atomic operation. It would take multiple steps to load the value of X, increment, add one to it, uh, save the result back out at least. So at least three machine instructions, maybe more for a typical computer architecture here. So without the semaphores, uh, even if they both ran 100 times, it is possible that you would end up with a non-zero value because you would get some race condition, some interference between the execution of those two, right? as, as we saw um, in previous examples here. So the question though, is it possible for it to be something other than zero if Fu and Bar both run an equal number of times? Um, okay, so again, you know, so I think technically uh, people are, uh, are correct here. So, I mean, if Fu and Bar run an equal number of times, then it is not possible for it to be, uh, anything other than zero because of the, the sum of work, right? But uh, so what I should have asked, uh, probably what I'm going to amend this question in the future if I use it again, is is it possible for Fu and Bar to run um, an unequal number of times, right? Um, and actually it is if depending on what type of semaphore is being used for S and R here, right? So we don't specify but if some of our S and R are strong semaphores, then um, then the answer is still that it's not possible for a result other than zero. So if these are strong semaphores, we're going to have a Q, and then we're going to uh, enforce that um, um, you know whoever was waiting on the semaphore longest will get it next, right? So in that case, uh, with a strong semaphore, there's an enforcement of of, uh, of fairness, which would um, ensure that um, uh, we end up running an equal number of times. So, so with a strong sum before, we basically get a synchronization mechanism as well 
uh, between the, the foo and the bar here, right? But if, if the semaphore is weak, uh, a weak semaphore, um, there's no guarantee that, you know, so, so, so you can come in here, let's say um, foo gets the semaphore S first, uh, and then while foo has S, bar tries to get the R, um, or let, let's say, uh, again, for the example, let's say foo has gotten both S and R's in the critical section. And while it's in the critical section, bar tries to get R, but it gets blocked getting R, okay? So if, if the semaphores aren't fair, uh, foo could release S and R and come right back up to the top and get S again um, and get R, even though bar is currently waiting on R, as, as I just had outlined in this scenario, right? So without the, the strong uh, fairness, criteria, um, there's nothing preventing foo from getting R again, even though bar is currently waiting on R, right? So in that case, uh, even though you won't get um, a, um, uh, a value of non-zero because of some interference, you know, so because uh, you, you lose some work being done to increment or decrement X, you could still get a non-zero value of X because of, um, unequal number of executions of these loops here, right? Um, so that was a comment that I had for a lot of people for the assignment one, or for, for the, the question one for the test here, right? Um, but yeah, in general, since I had assumptions about um, they both run an equal number of times, you know, so if they are running an equal number of times, then yeah, you would expect zero because the semaphores are going to enforce the correctness of the access to the X variable here. Um, but, you know, um, deadlocks can occur here. So there's nothing that prevents a deadlock. Um, so even though the semaphores will keep the, uh, the, the shared access to X um, from you know, the, being done correctly, um, um, it doesn't prevent deadlocks. You know, so we've got the classic because we, we access these in different orders. Um, if, if foo has, currently has S locked um, and, and bar currently has R locked, um, and then they both go to try and get a lock on the next semaphore, um, at that point, a deadlock is going to happen because they're, they're going to be blocked waiting on the other one, and the other the other process is is blocked um, and has a lock on that semaphore. So they're both holding and waiting one of the semaphores. They're holding one of the semaphores and waiting on the other one to become unlocked. So most people got B correct, um, and there's really no other answer for B. You know, so I mean, it is possible that um, the process can be blocked for other forever, right? So this is just a classic deadlock here. Um, can the concurrent execution of these processes result in indefinite postponement of one of them? So again, here, I didn't kind of give any caveats. So, so here, it's, it's more incorrect to not uh, figure out that, that there's a difference between the behavior if the semaphores are strong versus weak, okay? So um, again, if the semaphores are strong, um, you're not going to have any starvation issues because um, if if the two semaphores are if the two processes foo and bar are waiting on the same semaphore, um, they are going to be actually synchronized uh, um, by a strong semaphore because whoever's been waiting the longest will get it next. So they will actually um, execute. Um, um, uh, the, What's the correct term here? So, so uh, uh, they they will um, they will interleave exactly. You know, so first foo will execute, then bar, then foo, if the semaphores are strong. But if the semaphores are strong, as I already talked about, I mean, it is possible uh, for uh, foo to keep getting the two semaphores, doing an increment and releasing it. Right. So for the same reason why it can be unbalanced when the, when the semaphores are. Um, uh, week here, uh, you can also get starvation. It's not likely to get starvation, but but you know um, it could be that that for many iterations, 
uh, foo keeps getting S and R. So bar would be blocked uh, for an extended period of time of that if it foo kept getting it, right? So there's nothing that's gonna that, that's gonna make it likely for that to happen, but um, um, but there's nothing that prevents that either. So there's no mechanism that's enforcing um, uh, some synchronization here that, that's enforcing fairness if the semaphores are weak. All right. And by the way, these are called strong and weak semaphores, you know, so some people need to kind of get better at using the terminology correctly, right? So it's, it's not a powerful semaphore. Um, I mean, th this means something specifically. Um, you know, so, so strong means strong in the sense that it's enforcing um, um, fairness. So, th so there's a strong queuing discipline um, on the semaphore. Um, all right, so that's what I had wanted to say about um, the first one. So, you know, I didn't get anybody kind of bringing up the issue about strong versus weak semaphore, which is a little disappointing, but, but that is an issue there with that. Um, so for problem two, um, this was, I mean, I hope you know, so we, we didn't do anything like this in our problem set, but, um, uh, you know, you had to, to, to um, apply the banker's algorithm again, which we've done a couple of times um, for assignments for this class here. Um, so the basic setup is that we've only got a single, most of us already had this um, satisfactory to me, you know, um, uh, got it close enough. Right. So here we've got multiple processes, but we have a single resource, right? Um, and these are our current claims and allocations. Um, so from that, you can also uh, calculate the needs. So, so, so um, process one needs two of two of resource of the resource. Process two needs one. Process uh, three needs six. Um, process four needs uh, um, five currently, right? Um, the, the, the best way, I didn't get too many people doing this systematically, but um, the, the, the best way to prove this is just to show that um, if you only have one available of one, that um, the, the, the state is not safe. And if you not have two available of, of, the pro, of the resource, then it's not safe. But then when you have three available of resource that the system is safe and that's sufficient. Okay? So if there's only one of, of, of the resource available of our resource one, um, we can, you know, like I said, you know, if you look at the needs, uh, process two, we can satisfy, right? Um, uh, because there's one available, um, so we could run process two and we could release its one allocated resource. And at that point, we've got two um, now um, available, um, which is enough then to satisfy process one. So we could run process one and release it. So now we would have three available. But at that point, with, 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 where we start with one available resource, um, Oh, and by the way, I mean, you can tell how many total. So if we have, if we have one available and these are what's allocated, uh, so we've got seven currently allocated. So with one available, that means there was eight total of resource one for the case where there's one available here, right? Uh, but anyway, so continuing on here. Um, so after process one and two ran, we released those two. So we've now got three available, but that's not enough. We needed uh, uh, five and six and we don't have enough. A lot of people just jumped right right from that to, to, to having V is three, because you know that uh, if there's, we need to, after we run process one and two, we need to have five available. So we have to start off with three. So after we release those two allocated, we've got five, right? That, that's, I guess, perfectly valid, um, but be better to be a bit more systematic. So again, if, if you only have two available, you have the same problem, you can release, we can run process one and two. Now I've got four, but that's not enough to satisfy either process three or process four yet. 
But if we have three available when we release those, uh, we've got now five, uh, which means I can run process four. Um, and now I'll have seven available, which is enough to satisfy process three. So, so three would be safe. Um, so that implies that I have a total of um, 10 resources in the system, which a couple people noted, right? If, if I start with three available. Um, and I mean, that demonstrates a safe state. So, so the safe state with, with three starting available is uh, process two, process one, or process one, process two, and then process four, followed by process three. So all of them can run to completion um, and we've demonstrated that the state is safe, right? Um, oh, and another problem that I didn't mention. So um, with three resources, that means that we have 10 total, right? Because we've got seven plus three available, so that's 10. So that's enough to satisfy so another problem with, with starting with one is that there's only uh, eight resources, but we claim, process two claims it needs nine, right? So, so, so one is not going to work for two reasons. The, the reason I already said, but also because um, um, we can't even meet the maximum claim for one of the processes. With, there's only eight resources total in the system if there's currently one available. So this is a, this is a bad state here in that case. So. All right. Um, and then finally, so I was pretty, um, pretty, I guess I'll just say disappointed. Um, I, I did not see very many people at all kind of um, actually addressing the question and coming up with what was what was really kind of the correct answer here, okay? So uh, so we talked a little bit about the, the, the dying philosopher's problem because I knew I had this problem in here. Um, and, and you're given a solution, okay? So, I mean, in general, you know, if you're given written questions like this on tests or, you know, like, like in an actual situation at work or something, I mean, you, you really have to kind of address what's being asked. You can't just... Um, uh, propose a different solution. So I had a lot of that. Okay, so so people said, okay, I mean, you know, deadlocks are possible. Here's a solution. You know, let's let's change the order of picking up forks or things like that, right? But that's not really what the question was about. So um, the question is, um, if we do this instead, um, um, the philosopher picked up their left fork. Uh, if the right fork is available, they pick it up and start eating. Otherwise, he puts down his left fork and pauses for a random amount of time, okay? So does that solve the problem of starvation of the, the philosophers, right? Um, and remember, I mean, starvation happens because of deadlocks in this case, right? So I know that's a little bit confusing. I probably, probably should have emphasized this a little bit when I more when I talked about it, right? So, so the, the, the philosophers can starve in this case if they get into a deadlock, right? They can also starve. Uh, so a, a single philosopher could starve in the normal way that we mean starvation, that, that they never get both of their forks or they never get a chance to eat. But starvation happens here as well if a deadlock occurs. Um, uh, so we're talking about little, literal starvation instead of the starvation that we mean um, uh, by a process not getting a chance to run, right? So, um, that maybe could have been a little bit clearer in this problem here. But, but uh, what we're asking about here is that this mechanism actually prevents deadlocks. So it prevents that kind of starvation, the, the kind of starvation that occurs when the philosophers become deadlocked, because we've basically said, um, if the right fork isn't available, he puts down his left fork. Okay, that is actually an example of preemption, right? So we acquired a resource, but we preempt um, and we, we force the um, process to release the, the acquired resource before it actually uses it, all right? So that actually removes one of the three um, necessary conditions that we talked about for deadlocks to occur, right? So that was the, um, 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 not the hold and wait, but the, um, Um, uh, but, but, but the condition where um, 
you don't release your resources, right? Uh, the, the, the no preemption condition. Um, I'm trying, I can't remember um, how it was described, but, but anyway, so, so that was one of the, the, the three um, necessary conditions here, right? So by, by allowing preemption, uh, we, we actually guaranteed that, that, that deadlocks won't occur, right? So instead of being deadlocked, instead of everybody picking up their left fork and then being deadlocked uh, because there's no right fork available and nobody can put down a fork so that somebody can proceed, we guarantee that we can put down a fork and somebody can then pick that up and eat, right? So deadlocks won't occur, right? Uh, but um, as I des describe in here, I mean, starvation is still possible um, um, although it's unlikely. So if, if the amount of time, this is known as a preemption and with a random back off here, right? So if we pause for a random amount of time, um, and if everybody chooses a different, you know, use a thumb different random number generator to figure out how much time they're gonna pause before they pick up, it's very unlikely that the same philosopher uh, will keep finding um, that, their right fork is not available then, right? So, so, so you put down your left fork, you pause for a random amount of time, you're able to pick up your, your left fork, but then you find your right fork is not available again, right? I mean, that can happen if the person to the right, the philosopher to the right, happens to keep being eat, eating, um, uh, you know, just whenever the, the, this particular philosopher we're talking about has picked up their left fork and then, then is checking their right fork to see if they need to preempt or not, right? So it could be possible that, that for an extended period of time, the, the right fork is not available. So it preempts, puts them both down and tries again. That might happen for multiple cycles. There's nothing that, that, that um, prevents or, or, or keeps somebody from having multiple times where they have to preempt and, and try again, right? And if it happens enough, we would consider that a kind of starvation, right? But it's probably not likely, right? Especially if these are truly random. Um, I guess some people did mention, I mean, it is more or less likely depending on how long uh, the philosophers are eating here. So the longer that you're eating, the longer you have the two forks, um, so, so maybe, you know, something you could add into the analysis here is kind of the, the length of this random back off period to the length typically that uh, a philosopher is eating, right? So if your back off period is, um, is, is about the same or longer than the time you're eating, you would expect um, uh, starvation to be pretty unlikely. Um, all right, so that was test three. Uh, I thought I'd just kind of discuss those, mention those. Um, so like I said, the, uh, the example solution is posted um, and there's, um, um, I'll get the, the, the individual feedback to you. Um, uh, hopefully I'll get them finished up today. It was about more than halfway through here. So I'll get those back to you then. Um, all right. Um, oh, I forgot, I, I, I just realized I forgot to, um, so I usually put up an announcement about the activities for this week here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, uh, uh, this week we, um, if, if you didn't uh, notice it, started, we're starting on our next unit four, so the fourth of the fifth unit, uh, talking about ma memory management. So you should be doing the textbook readings and getting started on the problem set four um, for this week here. Um, So um, as usual, maybe I'll kind of look at the, pro the, the problem set four questions. Uh, we'll get started on this. Maybe I can talk some more detail of these uh, on Thursday as well, maybe. Um, and, and then we will get started on the program assignment as well for um, unit four here. So our fourth programming assignment um, is um, we're going to be doing, um, uh, working on a page replacement scheme. So that's talked about in chapter eight. So that's an important part of memory management. So making a page replacement decision uh, can greatly impact the performance of, of memory management on, on a typical operating system. So.
Um, so yeah, there's actually four uh, problems here. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the one that I'll probably leave off for more detail is that the last one is, is a, um, a straightforward, I ask you to simulate by hand doing some page replacement. Um, algorithms here, right? So I, I cover these in, in the videos for the lectures, uh, the lecture videos this week extensively, right? So you, so you should be comfortable, know how to do uh, least recently used uh, page replacement policy by hand, uh, first in, first out, um, um, the optimal page replacement policy and clock page replacement policy, the, the, the four or five that are talked about in our textbook for these replacement policies. We're, we're gonna be implementing, um, if I remember right, um, I'm gonna have you implement like a, a least recently used um, um, page replacement simulation, right? So, but we'll talk more about that next week. But anyway, this is meant to represent um, a stream of page references so, so this, this continues on to the next line. So, so first we refer, reference um, some data on page one, followed by then a reference at time two to a page to, to some data on page zero and so on, right? So, um, and you're given that uh, we've actually got four physical frames of memory. So initially memory is gonna be empty. So for the first three references, we're just filling up frame one, two, and three with pages one, zero, and two for any of these algorithms, right? And then this is gonna be an example of the hit. So, so page two is gonna be in frame, uh, frame three in this case, as I just called it, right? So this is actually a hit. This is another hit, right? So, so frame one is in page one. And then we, we fill up the, the fourth frame, frame finally with page seven. At, at that point, we've got our first miss where we have to make a replacement decision. So we have to kick out one of the pages, one, zero, two, um, or seven and replace it with six. And which page you replace, uh, that's your page replacement. And that will differ depending on whether you use the least recently used or FIFO or optimal or clock or whatever. So uh, for the first question, um, this is a question about uh, simple dynamic partitioning. So if you read our textbook, the, the first chapter actually goes through um, some uh, memory management uh, techniques that were kind of before what we would consider modern memory management techniques. So it's a bit historical, right? Um, so, so we normally use um, uh, segmentation or paging uh, with virtual memory. Uh, for modern operating system memory management. So, but before there was um, paging, there was what was known as partitioning, um, uh, or before there was actually seg segmentation. So, so dynamic partitioning is kind of like a, 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 actually a segmentation system. So it's where you um, allocate blocks that can be a variable length, right? And that's what really what segmentation is like, right? So again, I cover this in the lecture videos. The class this week. So, so anyway, here, though, so as a hint for this, I, I want you to tell me, think of this as a, um, uh, the, 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 the free blocks as, as being organized as a linked list, okay? So there's going to be a linked list of the, the, the blocks that are currently free that can be allocated um, to um, um, satisfy a new request for some, uh, for a memory partition here. Right, so that that free block list link list might be have like like ten blocks on it, so its size n might be ten. Right, so you need to give this to me in, in terms of big O notation here. Right, that's really what I'm looking for. Right, so if 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 there's ten blocks, so if n is ten, um, what is on average if I'm doing a best fit, how long am I going to have to search? Um, in my free block list to find the best fitting block, right? Um, or if I'm doing first fit, how long on average would I have to search to find a block that's suitable if I find if I take the first one that's of, of the correct size or bigger to, to use for the allocation, right? 
Um, I mean, yeah, so your, your answer really should be like, it's big O event or big O. Um, I mean, I, I guess I really don't want big O because um, all of these, I believe, are actually big O of N, but, um, you know, so, so maybe it takes, um, maybe it takes constant time, like big O of one, or like, like, like a constant time, so, so just one or two operations, but maybe you only have to search like half the list or a quarter of the list to find the values on average, usually. So in that case, you tell me that it takes n over two or n over four on average or something like that. Um, so for question two, um, you'll have to read about the paging system, uh, about about uh, uh, paging um, in chapter eight a bit um, to understand this question here. Um, So given that, that page sizes are to the 10, right? So that means that page sizes are a kilobyte to, to the power of 10 is 1,024 or a kilobyte, right? So that means that, that each page, uh, we need 10 bits. So, so this is talked about in the paging here. Uh, uh, we need 10 bits to specify the offset on the page there of, of the particular uh, bucket of information that we want, right? Um, and you're also given that um, um, there's actually uh, to the 16 pages of um, logical address space here. Right. Um, so from that information, you can figure out how many bits you need in a logical address. So for a logical address, you have to specify the page and then the offset within the page, just to mostly give you part A there. Right. Um, how many bytes are in a frame, right? So I, I actually just gave that one away as well. So whether you're talking about a physical frame or a logical page, uh, they're both gonna be of the same size. They're both gonna be of this page size and so on, right? Um, and then problem three um, requires some thought. So let me give you a few hints about problem three here. So what I'm asking about on problem three is that if you run this code, um, um, how frequently would page faults occur, okay? So basically you have to do some calculations about um, the size of things and you're given all the information that you need, okay? So you're given that uh, we're gonna be using demand paging, which is talked about in your textbook here, and that the, the page size is one kilobyte, okay? So one K again is the size for a page, but each of these integers, so, so uh, these arrays hold, uh, are two dimensional arrays that hold integers, okay? So if you do the calculations, um, um, if, if size is 64, there's actually 64 times 64 um, values in each array here. So if I can calculate that really quickly. Um, so there's 4,096 values. Um, and I'm going to stop calculating here because this is the kind of stuff you're supposed to be figuring out from this problem. But but th there's actually 4,096 integers in array A and also in B and C, right? But each integer takes four bytes, right? Um, so that should tell you the total number of bytes that each of these arrays takes, right? Um, and, uh, but I, I mean, I said, uh, I mean, it should be clear to you if you do these calculations that each uh, array requires 16 pages of space um, because uh, each uh, page is one kilobyte. Um, but um, um, I already said that um, we've got uh, 4,096 integers, uh, which means that we need uh, 16,384 bytes or 16 kilobytes um, for each array, right? So that, that's where the 16 page came from because uh, we need 16 kilobytes to hold all the values in one array. And we've got three of those. All right. um, now, in this case, there's actually only four pages that can be used for a working set. All right. And one of the pages is actually holding the code that's being executed. OK, so we've actually only got three other pages. So, so we're going to have one page to hold one 
uh, of the pages of the 16 of pages of A, and then one of them is going to hold one of the pages of the 16 for B, and then one's going to hold one of the 16 pages for C. So that's the, our typical state that the system is in here. So, so yeah, we're using three pages to hold the data, uh, and basically one page is going to be holding data from each of, of, of these three different arrays so that we can do the calculation, right? So if we have the, the page that we need that holds the data for this particular item in A and this particular item in B, we can read those values out of that page, add them together, and then we can store that result um, on that particular page of C that we want here. So, so just with those three pages, we can do this addition and then store the result, right? So given this layout of memory, so since these are two dimensional, uh, you have to come up with some way. So where does um, um, the, the value, the, the integer is zero, zero, uh, and what, what's the next value in memory? Because remember, memory is really one, is inherently just one dimensional, right? So what we're saying here is that um, um, all the, the pages in the first three row, uh, the, so, so think of this as the, the first index is the row, and the second index is the column of this two dimensional um, matrix here, basically, right? So, uh, um, so we, by, by saying this, we're saying that all the values in the first four rows, so rows zero through three, are stored in the first page, right? So that's, um, 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 that, that's, that's a row-wise layout, right? So, so, so the value at row zero, column zero is the first value, and then the, row, the, the value at row zero, column one is the next value, row zero, column two, so on, up to row zero, column 63. And then the next value after that um, is when we jump to the next row. So, so after all the values um, in row zero, uh, then we lay out the values in row one and so on. So from that information, you should be able to figure out, so a page fault occurs. Um, um, so if we had the values, these values uh, in here, we could do all the calculations we need as long as I is between zero and uh, three, right? But as soon as I is four, um, you know, so as soon as the row is four, um, a page fault is gonna occur. We, we won't have those values, we have to load the, the page for A that, incur, that, that has the rows four through um, seven, right? So the next four rows, All right? So anyway, so I'm looking for, um, so it would be best to actually tell me the total number of page faults that would occur, right? Um, um, or, or you can also say the frequency, but be, make sure you're explicit, you know? So how frequently, so, so how often, um, you know, so, so for what values of J and I do page faults occur if you're going by frequency there? Um, all right. That was all I kind of wanted to go over on problems at four. So like I said, I'll probably go over those again um, on Thursday. We'll see if anybody has started working on them, have questions specifically about any of the, about the problems at four questions here. Um, and we'll also get started on the um, um, program assignment at four, talk about it a bit. Um, that's it for this video and I'll see you guys later then.